Um, if you be following, God is saying something to us in this meeting. If you get it, you are going to be very strong people, be strong disciples of the Lord, wherever we are. And that's very important for me. Um, and I pray that God will help our hearts in the name of Jesus. And, um, okay. So, as groups, leaders, not today's topic, I want you to go to it when we are done with those groups. So, we have not finished FOCP. Then, pause FOCP, go to this one. Then, back to FOCP, those groups, so that it will help us. As a breaking it down, how do we apply these things? How do we really, really become these things? So, once again, with Jesus' joy, we are taking the first session in this second, second um, part of the meeting. And also open our heart and concentrate to the children, try and help them and just concentrate. So let's welcome Reverend Bumi to share with us his second session. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. You're not coming very well, though. Praise the Lord. Now, before we go into the session, let me actually appreciate you for the surprise birthday cake. I came to I came to share the word, but you end, you you did it. It's a, it's a positive coup, you know, because he didn't uh, tell me that was going to happen. But I must tell you. From the depth of my heart, I want to sincerely appreciate you. Thank you very much. The Lord we honor you in the mighty name of Jesus. One thing I've also learned is that anything you do for a servant of God because he's a servant of God, Jesus said you will receive the prophet's reward. So the Lord himself will reward you in the mighty name of Jesus. Shall we bow down our heads to pray? Father, we thank you for thus far you have led us in this meeting. Thank you for the grace that you have released upon our lives. Thank you for the understanding that you have given us. Thank you for the transformation that had begun. And thank you for what you will yet do in this session. And the remaining part of this meeting in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, your desire is that we will become vessels unto honor in your hand. And we shall remain so till we see Jesus face to face. Lord, let this be fully accomplished in our lives. And the lives of every person who is also following us online. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you because it is done. Speak your word to our heart again. Open our eyes to see the things that you are showing us. And let grace to live by this word be released upon everyone. Thank you, eternal Father. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Praise the name of the Lord. So this session, I will be talking about the making of vessels unto honor. The making of vessels unto honor. But permit me at this point to tell you three things the Lord spoke to me when I was praying in the night. First, he said, the vessels that are detained by the enemy from being ever useful to the Lord shall be released. And when he said that, I have to go and find out as if I was hearing the word detained for the first time. And I find out it's about there are vessels that are arrested and are kept in a custody. And say, this one will not be useful to the Lord. And the Lord said, the vessels that are detained by the enemy from being ever useful to the Lord shall be released. So don't be surprised if after these meetings, some individuals that you never thought they could be that 
wonderful version in the hand of God, you will see a change in their lives. Then you know that the Lord has done the work in their lives. And so shall it be in the name of Jesus. He said these vessels that are restrained from advancing for stronger impact shall be released. Somebody can be limited when it comes to impact. It's also a vessel. But there is a level stronger than the level he's operating from where the Lord wants him to be operating. And the Lord has proposed to release those who are restrained from advancing for stronger impact. And the third is that the vessel that had been abandoned still have hope, for they shall be revived. So if you remember the picture we had of the abandoned, the sunk Titanic vessel, it looks hopeless, isn't it? In fact, part of the history I read about it, it's still stuck there. And they say it has become just like grief, that there is nothing anybody could do to bring it out. So for that physical vessel, she's hopeless. But the Lord is saying, no, for the vessels that have been abandoned, they still have hope because it shall revive them. So I had to go and find us, I revive. And I discovered that to revive something means to restore from a depressed, inactive, or unused state. Because the way the word came to me, I have to answer as if I was hearing the word revive for the first time. It's an abandoned vessel. But it means it will be restored from a depressed, inactive, or unused state. So there is hope for the abandoned vessel. And I pray that the Lord will bring his word to pass in our lives in Jesus' name. So let's get to the next session, the making of vessels unto honor. Please take it to the next slide. Just keep it there. So I am showing you that it's a two-way process. If you read Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, which I captured there, Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If you look at that, you see there are two parts. The first part is capturing the phrase, follow me. Abi, and I will make you. Follow me. There is a comma there. That's one part. The other part, I will make you. So, there's a part of what you must do, and there is the part of what the Lord will do to you. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, because I want to go straight to the point. 2 Timothy chapter 2, when we read verse 21, so let's look at what you must do because your choice, you must do something. Give me that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. He said, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, now I am reading my note here from the English uh, Standard Version. Now he said, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, it will be a vessel for honorable use set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. If anyone cleanses, that's where he started from, himself, so it's a choice. When I'm asked to come to a place to minister, I listen, I like to listen to the set mind in the house. Because that will help me to understand what God planted in his heart while he's putting the program together. So I find out that when Apostle Debo was speaking, he talks about you've got to know God for yourself because this thing you have to personalize it so you locate your place 
and then you know the things you have to do, how you apply it to yourself. Are you getting what I'm saying? So when it says, if anyone, that means God has brought you to the level where he expects each of us to make the choice of what to do. Now, the first thing is you must have the vision of becoming a vessel unto honor. Am I communicating? Because there is little you can do for a man who has not made up his mind to be something. Does that make sense? What will spoil you up is that you have seen something. What you have not seen, you are, you are not going to pursue it. No matter what anybody say. I come to realize that why it's important to say, Lord, let me see what you are showing me. Because that you are hearing God doesn't mean that you are seeing what God is saying. Praise God. So what he said must become what you can see. It is then that it becomes very inspiring. Because you can see it. Look at Jesus. The Bible says, for the what? He saw the joy. For the joy he saw, he endured the cross. Have you? He saw something. That became the motivation to endure the cross. So, let's bring that. So, it's a personal decision. Once you have captured that, the choice of the other person should never discourage you. Is that clear now? So, we have laid the foundation. So, if anyone, so it's conditional, cleanses himself. So, what is the first thing you must do, therefore? Cleanse yourself from what is dishonorable. You cleanse yourself. And you, do, you don't cleanse yourself if you are not sensitive to what is dishonorable. The reason why you will go and wash your clothes is because you are where it is what? It is dirty. Isn't it? The reason why you wash your plate is because you recognize it is dirty. And so I cannot use it to eat the way it is. So you take it to the sink and then use soap, detergent, whatever and then you subject it to that process of cleansing okay now how dirty it is will determine how you will wash it, isn't it? if it is stained, you look for something else that is stronger than detergent if you have to scrub, you go and use iron sponge to scrub the, your objective is that it must be clean for it to be fit for use next time you want to heat am I communicating? So the Bible said, taking a cue from that wisdom, that is how we should deal with our life. What is important is that we want to be fit for the master's use. And he's telling us the master can't use just anybody. Therefore, each person must be sensitive to the state of his own heart. You've got to be sensitive. There are people, their prayer point will never be, oh Lord, deliver me from committing Fornication. That's not his problem. Do you know that was not the problem of Gehazi? His own problem was lost after material things. So if Gehazi were to apply himself to this scripture, what he will do is what? He has to cleanse himself of avarice, greed, covetousness. But he never did because he was not conscious that it's a problem in his life. So the Bible says, Cleanse, if anyone cleanses himself. So the first thing you must do, therefore, is to cleanse yourself from what is <coughs> dishonorable. Now, the word dishonorable <coughs> means shameful. What is shameful? Now, excuse me, Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 22. Sorry, I'm just getting. <clears throat> Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 22. Look at Jesus trying to tell us what is dishonorable. 
Because we need to know what is dishonorable for us to know what we have to cleanse ourselves of. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. 21. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Next. Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Verse 23. All these evil things come from within. And what? Defy man. So, I will not take the time of going through each of them. Take your time to look at each of the things Jesus mentioned. Now, it's Jesus who said that. He's not a pastor. And Jesus, who made man, says those are the things that are within a man and those are the things that defile a man. Meaning anyone who has any of those things within him is what? Is a dirty vessel. And the person will need to do what? Cleanse himself. Don't generalize. Let me tell you. If you really want to grow, you look at each of them and say, Holy Spirit, help me. Which one is affecting me here? I, I love what I heard Apostle Tebo say. Out, it was giving instruction how to break this thing down. And then we see, how do we now make attempt? To what? To apply this thing to ourselves. I mean, that's, 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 that's wonderful. Each of them. Which one? It's easy to say, well, I am not a murderer. But do you know, the Bible tells us that anyone who does not love his brother is what? If the Holy Spirit brings that to your heart, oh, you won't struggle to forgive somebody who offended you. You understand? I said, Lord, help me. I said, this is your problem. Years ago, I had a problem with procrastination. I didn't know. Procrastination was a problem. And every time, so one day I was praying, and the Lord had to take me back how procrastination had hindered me from doing so many things. I didn't see it as a problem. I remember how my mom would tell you, if you say something is expensive, and because of that you won't buy it, he said you will never buy anything. My mom told me that many years ago. So when the Holy Ghost, he reminded me of that. I didn't know it was a problem of procrastination. I remember when I was in part two, there was a particular textbook that up to today, I would have loved to keep in my uh, library or my shelf. It's called The Anatomy and Physiology of Farm Animals. Very good book. At that time, it was 35 Naira. Before that time, it was less than 35 naira. So because it's uh -uh, OT1 now, so I said, no, I won't buy it. Let me wait until the price will. And I'm telling you, I'm not sure that book is even in Nigeria. In fact, before I left part two, we couldn't see the book again because it was imported. I couldn't buy it. The Holy Spirit had to remind me. So that was a problem. Say, so you remember that? I said, yes. Say so it's because you are procrastinating. I also now discovered then when my boss gave me a job to do, and I would say, okay, I will do it later. Let me go and face my home. The man will come and say, where is the assignment I gave you? I'm looking, the man will be hungry. What was it? The Lord said, your problem was procrastination. That day I was lying down, and it was like that came from a very deep well. It came up to my conscious mind. He said, this is the reason why you are having problem, always coming behind. You are always behind schedule, behind schedule that is making your boss to complain. So what do I do, sir? He said, go on. So he gave me a different approach. When your boss gives an assignment, he said, make sure you prioritize his assignment over your own. Complete his work, go and give it to him. Then you can come back to your routine assignment. He said, because when your boss gives an assignment, the boss's assignment becomes the job. Your routine work must become secondary. I will tell you, that was when I was doing my graduate student program. From that moment as I applied it, because I discovered it was a problem, 
thank you, Lord, for helping me and all that stuff. I went in the dictionary. I saw a definition for procrastination or an expression. Procrastination is the thief of time. And the Lord asked me, is, there, is that is a thief? Is it procrastination? Is it a stone? Is it an object? Is it a spirit? So it's a demon. That changed my life. He said, when, it, when English, he said, not Bible, English said procrastination is the thief of time. He said, is it an object? If it's an object, can he steal? He said, so see procrastination as a thief. And what is stealing? He's stealing your time so that it can mess up your testimony. Ah, I changed it. I'll tell you till I left, till I completed my program, there was no occasion for my boss, my supervisor, to complain about anything. In fact, when I left him, he celebrated me with my two other colleagues. He was so happy. The day I defended my, that was my final paper, he came with my colleague, I'm proud of you guys, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you. But it wasn't like that initially. But when the Lord showed me that, I have, as it were, I have to cleanse myself. I don't know why I went there. Maybe that's somebody, for somebody here. I had to purge myself of that. And when I purge myself, it became easier for the Holy Spirit to deliver what the wisdom that I needed to get the job done. If anyone will cleanse himself. So this cleansing is serious. Until you are cleansed, he can't use you. But today, you will be cleansed. Amen. He will use you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The second thing you must do is that enter into a covenant of perpetual use with the Lord. And you must do it now. Enter into what? A covenant of perpetual use. In the first session, I talk about abandoned vessel. Once it's abandoned, it's no longer fit for use. Some of us in our houses, you have, you have pots, utensils, whatever. Container that you just put somewhere. You have not used them. You abandoned them. They are not useful to you anymore. But that will not be the story of anyone here. In the mighty name of Jesus. So when I talk about the concept of covenant of perpetual use. It is not Lord, use me for some time. Use me, let me know me. Okay. Now I understand Apostle Debo better. You know there are people who will go and consult occultic powers just to say, ah, I'm going to go to court, you know? Even if it's got for, for some time, for a season, for five years, like everywhere, they will know that, yes, I'm everywhere. What happens after that? That's not a covenant of perpetual use. That's a covenant of periodical use. For some time. For a while. That's not the plan of God. He wants to be using every one of us till we see him face to face. So you have to enter into say, Lord, this is my life. I want you to be using me till I see you face to face. Are there scriptures to help us to recognize that? In Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. I believe when Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I believe that's what Paul is opening our eyes to see. It's a covenant of perpetual use. If I, as long as I'm alive, I am for Christ. I live for him. And Jesus heard him when he said that. If I die, it's a game because I'm going to see him. So Paul is saying it's not to be used for some time. I want, as long as I'm breathing, I must be useful. I must be living for him. I told them in church at the time, he said, for me, at this age and at this level, nothing matters to me other than to be promoting the interest of Christ. If it is at variance with his interest, I am not interested. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, look at what Paul said. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. 
The life I now live in the flesh, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. Now, the same scripture is very interesting in the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation, look at what it said. My whole identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. That means my whole life is dead. Oh, thank you. My whole identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives. It's history. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life. Can you see a man who understood what happened at Calvary? The man that, I don't know where he was, but definitely he wasn't following Christ at that time. You knew that now. now but he now, when he met Jesus, he said, look, I had a path, that past was nailed to the cross when Jesus was nailed there. Now, this is where we need, yes, spiritual understanding of what happened. Spiritual understanding of what happened. Now, I, now this, like a teaching meeting, sometimes people will tell you about, okay, okay you know, we take the scripture literally and all that stuff. And I say, thank you, it's correct. Some people will say, let's follow the grammar. I say, that's correct. But I found out the best interpreter and the teacher of the word is the one who inspired the word. Yes or no? And who is he? The Holy Spirit. So when I read the Bible sometimes, I say, okay, how did Paul get this understanding? The Holy Spirit. Made him to understand that when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, his, his past was nailed to the cross. He gave him that understanding. He said, you want what Jesus did there to help you? Paul, see yourself as nailed to the cross with Jesus when he was there. And when he died, that old man died with him. The man that resurrected is a new life. The same mystery is, is described in baptism. We were buried with him. Our whole life was buried. When we stepped out of the water, we stepped into a new life. Somebody said, but that's not, you just came inside water, you come out. Okay, you don't, you, you are still limited by physical things. That's the spiritual interpretation of what happened. When that understanding comes, there is no way you feel comfortable living in the past. So Paul said, and now the essence of this new life. So this new life is not to shout. It's not for people to praise it. There is a purpose. Remember, when Prof was teaching the other time, he talks about the master has a purpose for making the vessel. Did you remember? All right. Because that is very important. The essence of this new life is no longer mine. I've come to realize this, what disciples dis discovered. Once I give myself to Jesus, I've lost control over my life. I've lost control. That's the truth. And the moment a Christian understands that, you don't struggle with them. Because it up ultimately is in your interest. He said, for the anointed one lives his life through me. You know what that means? You thought it's your life. Let me tell your neighbor, have you given your life to Jesus? You have no life again. But it's life. Ah. It's the reason he can come and tell you and say, Lord, I have my own ambition. I say, you give you your ambition. Sorry, this is my plan for your life. And you can be arguing. It won't change anything. Until you agree with him. He said, he lives his life through me. Years ago, one day I was studying and he said, you are the body of Christ. And the revelation came to me. They say it's not in the plural sense alone. Personally, you, 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 you. You are the body. You, the spirit of Jesus is in you. And because his spirit is in you, he lives in his life through you. Because spirits need body to manifest, to express. So the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ in the believer wants to use the body of the believer to express himself. And I had an, a strange experience. 
The moment that revelation hit me, my physical body vibrated. I wanted to know why. He said, because that's a revelation that doesn't come naturally. When that revelation comes, it broke something within me. Because the flesh will limit the expression of the spirit. So when the light came, it broke that limitation. And that's why my body vibrated. My body reacted. It has not been difficult for me from that time to align with his cancer for my life. No matter how difficult it is. Why? Because he's living his life. It's no longer your life. It is his life. And so if you want to move in a dimension, it, he has liberty. Do you understand what I'm saying? He has the liberty because he's just expressing himself through you. That's why we don't say we are the one doing anything. He's the one doing it. Amen? Does that agree with your theology? Eh? He's the one using us. So Paul said, he's living his life through me. He said, we live in union as one. Amen? He said, my new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life to mine. To mine. I like that. Hey, mama is the pharmacist, but you understand that too now. He dispenses his life into... What does that mean? It means my own body became a container and he is pouring himself into me. Now, why does anybody buy any medicine inside a container? Is it because of the container? But because of what? It dispenses his life into my Praise the name of the Lord. Give me that second Timothy chapter 2 again. Verse 21. And it says, set apart for holy use as holy use. Now, so let's look at verse 22. Second Timothy 2, 22. Look at what he said. Can we read together to be so sure that you are with me? Flee also youthful loss. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Praise the name of the Lord. So we see what you must do. The third thing you must do. Flee, pursue, and stay. Three, one. Flee, pursue, which is what is written as follow there, and stay. I'm going to bring the, those three principles out. It's three, one. Flee youthful passions. When you check that expression, youthful passions means, in Greek text, literally means revolutionary desires. Revolutionary desires. So he said, flee. You know, young people can say, no, no, we want to do this, we want to do, we want to behave like this and all that. He said, mm, don't live like that. Especially when it's not consistent with what looks like pardon I mean the expression old school, the way they have been doing it say, we want to, no that's not it, we must change everything Bishop Waluke said something some years ago, he said you can change the package but you can't change the message you can change how you present the message but you can't change what the message, you cannot now, revolutionary desire, which is typical of the young, uh, youth, young people, say, no, must it be like that? No, 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 no. Now, for as long as it is the message, you can't change it. So Paul was aware of that tendency in a young person. And writing to Timothy was young, he warned him, flee, youthful lost. You know, until I checked that and I discovered that, okay, then, even though the way we've been interpreting it is not wrong, because we think about, okay, drinking, partying, and all that stuff. In a way, it could be revolutionary ideas. You know, this day, somebody will say, no, uh -uh, can you say Christian? Well, Christian, can't we go to parties? Have you heard people say that? You mean? Have you seen Christian, you know, young people will say, look, church is boring. Have you heard that? Church is boring. Revolutionary desires. 
church is not boring when the Holy Ghost is there. Praise God. So he said, flee youthful passions, revolutionary desires that we want you to behave in a wild way. You know, one day I was meditating, you know what they call the younger generation? What do they call them? Gen Z's. And one, strangely, the Holy Ghost has a way of drawing my attention to some things. He said, are they the one who created them? That they now say it's Gen Z, that means after them there will be no generation. Because if Z is the last alphabet, and you call them Gen Z, he said, are they the one who created them? Are they saying there will be, be no other generation? I have to go and start looking at, how did they even arrive at that expression? And go and find out how they arrived there. Praise God. Revolutionary desires. It's a fleet. Because it can make, it can turn you against the old landmarks. That's why he was cautioning him. Some things can be changed, but there are things that you cannot change. Praise God. Number two, what are you to follow? So I say, you do what? You flee, you also pursue. Now, this is interesting. Flee youthful loss, but follow. Let's stop there. Why did Paul say, but follow? He was cautioning him against something. Flee this, but don't stay idle. Follow this. In other words, I don't want your attention to be distracted by this. However, it is also dangerous that your mind is in vacuum. So, engage your attention with what? These five things. Because anyone who is not pursuing anything, the challenge is he will become complacent. You remember the story of the young prophet? Huh? You remember? I don't want to take you to that place. Remember, what happened? After he had delivered the message, he was going back. The Bible says he sat down under a tree. He wasn't pursuing anything again. He was resting. And that was where the whole prophet caught up with him. And that was where he was misled. And eventually he was destroyed. That will not be your story. In the name of Jesus. So, flee youthful passions, but pursue kingdom interest. Godly interest. And it's not an assumption. You pursue it. You know your mind is focused on it. You know you are desirous of it. And you know you are devoted to pursuing kingdom interest. You must know that in your heart I'm pursuing it. With all vigor. With strong focus. That's what you mean to pursue something. Like a lion pursuing its prey. How many of you love watching wildlife documentaries, Nat Geo? Eh? I love working that. You know what? I, there is never a time I watched it, I won't praise God. I become like David. You will see all manner of animals, you say, God, ah, you created this one again. And then you'll be praising God. But you know what I found out about the lion? They said the lion, it doesn't matter whether it's a herd of buffalo. Once he sees one, the one that it focuses on is the one that the lion will keep pursuing. Let all of them be running together. It never gets distracted. That particular one is what it will focus on until it gets it done. That's the power of focus. So when he said pursue, that must be the, that's the picture of how to pursue godly interest. What are they? Righteousness. Please note this down to help us. If you flee or run away from youthful passions without pursuing something else, you will soon get tired and be tempted to backslide. I've said that. Second Kings chapter 13, but we we'll won't go that. Also know this. What you pursue is like a vision driving your life. The lack or loss of vision we automatically stop motion. Okay? That's why the Bible says that where there is no vision, there is no what? The people perish. Have you? Is that correct? You know why they perish? 
because they stop moving. Nothing is driving them. Nothing is driving them. And if you are not moving any, toward anything of value, you stand the risk of becoming a victim of the ravaging adversary. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. So let us look at what the Bible says you should pursue. Number one is what? Righteousness. What is righteousness? Right living and right way of doing things. I go back to what Apostle Debo said when he ran up, was standing up the other time. He said, if every Christian is doing the right thing in Nigeria, what happens? Nigeria will be better. Do you agree? So we must make up our mind that we go out from this conference and be doing the right thing. Within our sphere of influence. I can tell you as somebody who has worked, you know, the private business for years, I can tell you, it's not easy. People will attack you, people will castigate you, people will persecute you. People, in fact, they can also sit, limit your promotion. But it won't mean nothing to you. Why? Because you are pursuing what? Righteousness. That's why it must be a pursuit. It's not that we are doing it because we are Christian. No, you must get it from this perspective. It's a pursuit. Somebody says it's a pursuit. Remember in Matthew 6.33, Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? It's righteousness. You know we stop and seek ye first the kingdom of God. No. He said, and what? It's righteousness. The right way of doing things from kingdom perspective, you must also seek it. So when that becomes the motivation of a Christian, Honestly speaking, whatever is the persecution, you can overcome it. Amen? You can. Then he said, well, should you pursue again? Faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. Faith is the eternal requirement for relating with the Lord. Faith is the eternal requirement for relating with the Lord. You must believe the Lord for you to become anything in his kingdom. Try and study about men whom God used and God is still using. I mean, vessels unto honor. You will find that something among them all. There's a common denominator. Is what? Faith. They believe God for the impossible. When things seem like, can it work? They say it's not a question of whether it can work. God said it will work. That's faith. Sometimes the Lord's word or instruction may not make sense to you. Just believe and you will see the glory of God. John chapter 11, verse 8 to 40. John chapter 11, verse 8 to 40. Jesus visited the house of Lazarus, who was already dead. He went, he met the sisters. And after some words, he said, okay, take me to where you laid him. And then one of them said, no, by now, it's four days, by now you'll be stinking. What did Jesus say? He said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see what? The glory of God. No one sees the glory of God without faith in God. It takes faith in God to see the glory of God. It takes faith in God to see the glory of God. So faith is eternally required for us to work with God. God doesn't make sense. That's to mortals. But he makes sense to God in his realm. In Ezekiel chapter 37, son of man, can this dry bone live, live again? You know Ezekiel was smart. He said when he looked at it, they were all what? He said they are very dried bone. Humanly speaking, no hope. So what he responded by saying what? Lord thou know it. And that expression alone made God to bring him to his realm. And God said, okay, now, this is how it works in our realm. Oh, yeah, prophesy to it. And God was not taking him through, like, a Montessori class pupil. Because that was what he was in the school of the spirit. So, so yeah, prophesy to it. Say like this. Dead bone, dry bones, oh, yeah, rise again. And he was also following God. Dry bone, rise again. And I said, hey, the pure, hey, the mighty sand. And then God taught him the power of observation. He said, I saw bones joining to bones. Sinews joining to bones. He said, I saw that. He said, but there was no what? Breath. And then God said, yeah, yeah. Professor, I breath also. So that means until 
what God said we, he want to do has happened. You don't stop so what? Declaring his word over the situation. And that's the reason why you find out these guys will say things that people will tell you this is weird. Those are common words I found out among Christians today. Sometimes I go online, I want to check, and then you see the netizens comment. My oh my, if you don't have stamina, you better don't appear on that space. That's the truth. Years ago, I read that and I say, ah, ah, even Baba Debo, you know, criticize to buy, even we hold Baba Debo, you, oh, that, that's netizen for you. That space, if you don't have the stamina, you better stay away from it. Then we, you see what? Weird. What's this guy saying? This guy is, ah, this is scary. I say, come on, Satan is not friendly. You better know who is he so that you can know how to move against him. Are you here with me? So, but how are those guys able to see all those things? Daniel, I saw, and what they are describing. You say, uh-uh, how can a man see all this and he's still alive? Faith. Faith builds in man the capacity to relate with the supernatural. That capacity. So, that's why he said we must grow in faith. As you are growing, your capacity to understand what God is telling you is being strengthened. A time comes, God said it. You don't even struggle. You say, God, if since you have said this, sir, it is done. You are not thinking about it won't be done. It's, if it is God, I've had him. It will be done. People are telling you, will it happen? You say, God has said it. How will it happen? I don't know. But I know once he said it, he's committed to doing it. That's faith. That's how God, because you can't go far with God without having faith in God. And this faith is not for one day. It is until we see Jesus face to face. That's why there are three that remains. Hmm? On head. Love. Faith. And which one? Eh? Hope. But which one is the greatest? You know why love is the greatest? Because God is love. When we get to heaven, we don't need faith again. Abi, do we need faith? Do we need hope? You only hope for what is not seen. Isn't it? So those two are eliminated. They are for here. When we get to heaven, love still remains relevant. Why? Because God is love. But here, you need faith. You need hope. What you have not seen, you are believing God for it. So Paul told Timothy, he said what? Pursue faith. Let me tell your neighbor, pursue faith. How do I know you are pursuing faith? Stop bothering yourself about the exchange rate. Stop bothering yourself about what? The exchange rate. Have you gone through town? Have you seen guys building solid houses now? Where are they getting the money from? Stop. From outside. Your own too will come from outside. Praise God. How do I know God? How did God get? Go and read the story of Elijah and the widow of Sarifath. Hello? The widow of Sarifath. God told the prophet, say, I have commanded a widow woman to do what? And when he got to the woman, hello, mama. Thank you, man of God. Please get me water to drink. Uh, by the way, had bread to eat. Ah. Prophet, we only have one meal left. Just for me and my son. And once we've taken that meal, we are waiting for death to what? To come. Abi? And then the prophet said, mm, 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 mm. it's like, that's not what I had. Are you going to point? That's not what I had. That was the reason why he prophesied to the woman. Because two questions I asked. Number one, God, if you say you commanded the woman, the moment Elijah saw him, I mean saw her, the woman said, hey, praise God, I've been expecting you, man of God. But the woman didn't say. Her response did not show that God has spoken to her. Yes or no? Because he said, Daddy, I only have one meal left. We eat it, we die. Was God lying? No. When God told you something, and you are confronted with a situation that is trying to make God a liar. Don't pay attention to the situation. Speak what God said to you to the situation. 
That is when what God said, the power to make it happen will be activated. The moment he said to the woman and prophesied, he said, no, that flower you are talking about won't be exhausted in this house. I'm paraphrasing. The oil that you need to bake will never dry up in this house. Did the woman say anything? She kept quiet. God arrested her. Don't frustrate my plan here. So there is a time to keep quiet. Even when we are reading on the news, NNPC has changed price. This one has press price. I tell people, God says through Paul, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Is that not what he said? All your needs. So when the needs are increasing, the supply increases. That's what to tell God. Lord, you had to supply, I mean, the needs had increased. So the supply has to increase and God will increase the supply. Praise the name of the Lord. Is somebody listening to me here? Because I found out the reason is this. When you confront certain situation, it dampens your faith. It weakens your faith. And once it weakens your faith, you start thinking differently from the way God wanted to think. That will pollute and defile your heart. And so that limits how the master can use you. So you must learn how to speak words of faith like men of faith. Elijah didn't allow that. He said, oh, madam. A prophet and she kept quiet. She didn't say anything. So when you speak word that aligns with what God tells you, you activate the power to make it happen. Naaman was not going to respond to the instruction of the prophet Elijah. Go to River Jordan, dip yourself into it seven times. For as long as he was standing angry, his leprosy remained with him. The moment he went there and dipped, what happened? He received his miracle. When you act on God's word, you activate the power to bring it to pass. When you act on God's word, you do what? You activate the power to bring it to pass. Somebody say amen. amen. It's in love. Pursue love. Pursue love. Pursue love. Love Jesus. Love for Jesus is another indispensable demand to be fit for the master's use. You read the story of John chapter 21 talking about Peter. Peter's last screaming for being confirmed by Jesus for the apostolic office in the first century church was based on love for Jesus. Jesus called him after they had backslidden with his other disciples. You remember he visited them at the Sea of Galilee, also known as Sea of Tiberias, and he called them. Guys, do you have food to eat? They said, we have none. Okay, have you caught fish? We've caught not fish. Okay, throw your net now for a great cash. They throw it through the net. Pew, 153 big fish. If a man stays in God's will for his life, he does not struggle for life. If a man stays in God's will for his life, he does not struggle for life. God knows the time he will intervene. He will interrupt whatever he's been responsive for his struggle and they will turn things around for him. When they threw the net in obedience to Jesus, they caught fish. John chapter 21. You know it's there from verse 1. But that's not the point. By the time they were trying to bring the fish out, suddenly they discovered that Jesus was already cooking fish for them. Hello. Because they saw, they saw fire and fish on it. He had to ask them to bring, take out of the one you caught. Had it to it. Jesus didn't say anything. After they have eaten, he called Peter aside. And guess what was the question? Do you love me more than this? I told you in the morning, agapawel. A-G-A-P-A-O in Greek. Jesus wasn't asking. The word there was not filio. When Peter responded, he responded with filio. You know I love you. His own response was filial, not agapawel. Jesus was demanding for agapawel. He was responding with filial. Jesus wasn't impressed. Second time, do you agapawel me? He said, but you know I filial you. 
Jesus said, Obey the yell. I'm not asking for fondness. I'm not talking about you like me. Are you fond of me? I'm talking about are you totally committed to me? This is what I need. Love for Jesus is not loving him. Not, it's not longing for him. It's not being fond of him. It is are you totally committed to me? Are you subsumed by my interest? Wherein you have nothing left but only what I have for you. That's the depth of that word. Do you know it is what made the father to release his only begotten son? For God so loved the world is the same thing. So the demand of love is stronger than the way we English presented to us. It's not just about being fond of Jesus. You know, we are excited. Being mm -mm. That for Jesus, it means absolute commitment to promoting only Jesus' interest at any cost. That's why you might find out the disciples had a different orientation in the Holy Church. Where they could flog them. And you see guys say, praise God, for we have been counted worthy to suffer with them. Excuse me, are you guys crazy? No, they were not crazy. It's a revelation that was working on the inside of them. If we suffer with them, we shall reign with them. Praise God. Is somebody listening to me here? So we must understand. So when he told Timothy, pursue love. Pursue it. And I'm talking about love for Jesus. If you love Jesus, you will love the brethren. That's the truth. I've come to realize anyone who loves Jesus, don't criticize or condemn other believers. They may not be operating at the same level with you, but you don't hate those who, those who love Christ don't hate. Praise God. And number fourth, number fifth thing he said they should pursue is what? Peace. So this is the key to social harmony and the bedrock of divine presence in every relationship. You know, Hebrew 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men. And what? Holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. So when Paul was telling follow peace, he knew what he was talking about. God is looking. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called what? Nah, okay, okay. okay. Go back to disciple 101 class. Praise God. Praise God. Now, go back to that second Timothy. I want to show you the last one. Stay within the community of followers of Christ. Look at it. Is. No, go back to second Timothy chapter 2 verse 22. Yes? No, 22? 22. Thank you. What did you say? Um, do what? Follow with them. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace on your own? No. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What is he telling him? He's telling him to stay within the community of followers of Christ. Stay within. Stay within. Stay within. Stay within the community of followers of Christ. You must stay under the jurisdiction of Jesus to be useful to him. In John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. End of quote. Also, do not forsake this assembly of the brethren. It is more essential in these last days than even in the first century. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. It is not a time when somebody says, I want to go solo. You know, somebody came to see me at a time, and then when we get talking, I say, okay, which church do you attend? He said, actually, he wasn't attending any church. Um, you know, these days, as the spirit leads, you know, I, you know, that is common now. You know, as the spirit leads, I just go as the spirit leads. Unfortunately, I found that that's not how the spirit leads. Jesus, so I told him, I said, do you know what? Jesus emphasizes growing within the community of believers. I said, do you know what happened? Jesus spent his time praying for each of the disciples. But no, he, he developed them within a community. 
He brought them together. Jesus will have come. Oh, when I, when I need the grace over Peter, I will go and meet Peter and say, Peter, come. You see, um, you will go to do this one. Go to the fish, uh, to the sea. Cast your hook. Catch fish. Come. All right? When I need somebody who is going to be an activist, I go and meet uh, Matthew the Zealot. Abby? And say, you, you go and make some noise there. No. He brought them together. And he built them up together. That's the pattern of Jesus. So when you, I see believers who say, well, my last church, I had problem with the, my pastor there. So since that time, I want to be on my own so that as the spirit leads, it's a lie. May I also submit to you, this is not COVID area, era. I'm an online church member. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Let's not promote that too. Let's not promote that too. That is for people that are far away and circumstances made it difficult for them to join, to have access to a place of worship where they can serve Jesus. That they are the one that online presence is meant for. But huh, you must be a member of a church. That's the pattern of Jesus. Hello. That's the pattern of Jesus. And we must maintain that pattern. What else must you do? I am focusing on what you should do. What, because the Lord has no problem doing what he should do. Okay? It's you. So what must you do? Keep spiritual, keep fit spiritually. If you are, the Lord is going to use you, and from my study of men that God used and is using, I found out they always remain fit spiritually. I love sport. Do you know if you are a footballer, it does not matter if you scored 30 goals last season. After the season, you travel to your village. And then you went to go and oppress. But but what champion has come. And everybody is celebrating you. They take you to pepper soup joint, suya point, and you are just eating everything because you have missed home. And then by the time you get back to camp, the coach can psychologically know that this boy is overweight. He looks at you. He will send you to the physio. He will send you to the trainer. If you can say this one, let him be training alone. Until you have burned all the excess fat, the first match, he won't, fit, he, won't, he won't fix the person. He won't feel them. Why? And they ask coach, no, the striker, how can you bench? In fact, he didn't even appear on the list today. A 100 million euro striker. He said, this match rusty. Those coaches, especially those Oyibo coaches, they don't, they don't care. They just tell you he's not yet fit. If he's not fit, we can't show him. We can't display him on the match, on the field. We can't display him on the field until, it is, until he is fit. The master will not display you. He won't use you if you are not fit. Some were fit yesterday. They are not fit today. He will bench them. You know why? He doesn't want to risk losing you. Years ago, I read somewhere, Papa Billy Graham said, God doesn't use a, discour a discouraged soldier. He's not fit for battle. So, you must keep fit spiritually. You ask me, how do you do that? You must be fasting. You must be praying. You must be studying your word, the word. <clears throat> you must be doing that. Fasting. Oh, fasting is for them. God has done all the fasting. I heard a story that they said, you know, a particular minister, a group of ministers travel out of the country. It's a story. I've, I didn't get another place to confirm it. But it was a story that made sense. And then they went with the Oyibos. And then he said, ah, what is happening? You are not taking breakfast. They said they are fasting. They said the Oyibos, their host, laughed. They said, what have you been doing all night? That's why it's called breakfast. That's why it is called breakfast. You are breaking the fast. You have been fasting all night. Now, those are the things some people will come and say, oh my God, we are suffering in Africa. You know, we, you see, even the Oyibos who brought us Christianity, they don't practice it the way we practice. Listen to me, point of correction. They brought it here. They, it, it does not originate in them. Make no mistake. There is a difference. Somebody introduce you to something, and the other person is the manufacturer. 
They're not the same thing. Marketers are not manufacturers of the product. So don't tell me because Oyibo brought Christianity to Nigeria, the way they practice it is the way I'm practicing it when I can read the Bible. And the Holy Spirit, who is the one who inspired it, is speaking to me because he has dispensed his life into mine. I was in Austria, our host was telling me, he said, Pastor, I observe that all you are drinking is, you know, orange juice. I won't argue with you. It's your observation. I just was married. He said, but you know, this is Austrian wine. You can't get it anywhere in the world. I came all the way from Nigeria. It is Austrian wine that I'll be drinking, I'll be thinking about. I left palm wine in Nigeria. I will now come to Austria and be drinking Austrian wine. Excuse me. I was just smiling. It didn't mean nothing to me. He could take pride in the Austrian wine. I'm taking pride in being drunk in the wine of the spirit. Keep fit spiritually. Help me tell your neighbor, keep fit spiritually. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 says, First Timothy 4 8 says, physical training is good. But training for godliness is much better. Promising benefit in this life and in the life to come. I know brethren try to sometimes teachers try to whittle down this thing by saying, see, let's take the Bible says that physical training is good. So let's take that good part of it. Listen to me. That's not interest of Paul. He's telling us he prioritize what? Spiritual training. I'm not against physical training. Trek, jog, do press up, do aerobic exercise. Fantastic. But that is, if it's helping you bodily, Paul said, learn wisdom from that. The day God delivered me from struggling to fight fast many years ago, he said, just as eating food makes your physical body strong and fat, he said, when you fast, your body, be, your spirit becomes strong and fat. Doesn't look contradictory. That fasting makes my spirit. But he says it's yours, my spirit, not the body. The body will be weak, but the spirit is strong. Let nobody tell you that fasting is not necessary for this generation. Maybe we need it more. Uh, Apostle Debo will have you. He will have shared, share his testimony. He shared with me when he began to fast for months. I've not seen one man whom God uses, a vessel, that will tell you he didn't fast. If you see one, I'm not going to learn from him. Why? I know time he asked me to fast for days. I know time I have to fast for months. And I know when they will say, son, you know, I don't want them to start looking at you as if you are suffering. Stop fasting now. Praise God. And if you are eating too much, he has a way of letting you know you are already eating too much. You are eating too much. You are eating too much. Okay, you are eating too much. If you want to say anything, you are eating too much. You are eating too much. That's the making. That's part of the process. I can tell you that's part of what he does to prune you. This excess weight will not allow you to be fit for my use. You've got to shed it. I can And it go on the next seven days. By the time you are coming, by the third day, your spirit will be, before he speaks, you have picked the signal. Amen. You know all this one the Lord is saying. Sometimes the Lord, at a particular time, he has not spoken. You can pick the signal. And the signal is correctly interpreted. The spirit is so sharp, there is no interruption. The divine telecommunication network is clear. Signal come, you pick it. But let me tell you, if all you are doing is, <laughs> you know, at this level, we don't need to fast again. 
Sir, God help you. God help you. Are you listening to me here? So you can't be leaving everything. You carry this one, carry chocolate, carry ice cream, carry everything and all that stuff. You won't be spiritually fit. So one of the things that Lord will do for you, because I don't want to go beyond my time, one of the things that Lord will do for you is that he will prune you. Those excesses, he will cut it off. And if I may help you, I like to keep to time when you give me time. I believe that that's the area I want to identify, you know, amplify. But guess what? As I was thinking about the, titan the Titanic that sunk, the Lord brought to my mind the church at Laodicea. I was in place of prayer when I thought I've got everything he wanted me to pay attention to. I said, no. I was praying. I said, go to the church at Laodicea. What happened? Please show me Revelation. Let's close with that. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 14 to 22. Okay, maybe you give me two, three, four more times. Can we read that? Can we look at it? And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, this thing said the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. What do I make of that? Any lukewarm vessel, person, God can't tolerate. Okay? So that means when, one of the things that God will do when you want to make a vessel unto honor out of your life, he draws your attention to this. What is making you to be, to be lukewarm? Remember the things that defy. The things that defy, it does not matter how hot you are. Once you allow those things, they will bring down the, your, your spiritual temperature. It will come down. So it's God say, God is warning. Deal with that. Alright? Verse 17. Because thou sayest I'm rich. That sounds like the description of the Titanic. Because it was described as open. Only rich people. There are some very, there was very rich people who were in that ship when it sank. Very wealthy, very wealthy. Just like the, the what do you call it, the yacht that sank recently in uh, Britain. Was it in Britain or Italy? In Italy. Where this uh, English uh, tech, giant tech, whatever. I've forgotten the guy's name. He sank. Okay? Now, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Pride. Self-centeredness. Completely out of alignment with the Lord. He said, what you don't know. Now, hear this. What you say about yourself is not necessarily what is true of you. Ah, you didn't get it. Because he said, and you do not know. You say, I am rich, I am increased with goods, I have need of nothing. He said, but you do not know. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So oftentimes, what a man say about himself is not actually who he is. He's being deceived. He's being blindfolded from seeing his true nature. Only the Spirit of God can reveal to you your state per time. Your spiritual state per time. So it's dangerous for a man to be out of alignment with God. Because when you are out of alignment with God, it becomes difficult for the Spirit of God to reveal to you your true spiritual state. So he said, you don't know. As I read about the Titanic, they said the problem was not because it was actually it hit a very big iceberg and it sank Immediately. So, some commentators now ask, could that happen again today? They say it's rare. Reason is because that time, there was no, they, the device, like the radar, whatever, to be able to see from afar that there's danger, there's going to be a massive obstacle. It was lacking in that ship, despite all that they said they put there. 
So if a man cannot see far, he stands the risk of colliding with an obstacle that can make his destiny sink. That will not be your story. Years ago, God opened my eyes. Just keep it there. I'm coming to round up with that. Psalm 32 verse 8, I was reading and God said, I will teach you, I will instruct you in the way you should go. But you know what he said? He now said, I will do what? I will guide you with my eyes. I said, Lord, uh -uh, why do you need to do that again? You teach, you instruct. I think that should be enough. You know what he said? He said, there are things your eyes will not see. Only my eyes will see. And so even though I teach and instruct you, I still decide I will guide you with my own eyes. So when you are seen with God's eyes, I'm telling you, there are temptations, there are booby traps, there are barriers that the enemy will think, if he set this trap, he will fall into it. But because you are seen with his eyes, you know what happens. That's when he said, this one, you can't walk through it. I don't want you to walk through the fire. I don't want you to walk through the waters. I want you to mount wings as the eagles. So he just fly over. And then they are wondering, where did he pass? Where is he? Where is he? They say, is the one sinking the other side, jumping. How did he pass through this? Because God guided you with his eyes. And gave you the enablement to overcome it. But let's, verse 18. He said, verse 18, please. Are you there? Oh, what's going on? Verse 18. I cancel you. This is a cancel. This is what the Lord will do with you when he's trying to make a vessel unto honor out of your life. He said, I cancel you. To buy of me, he brings you back to himself. Every vessel of honor, God will always bring back to himself. When he sees that you, have, you are falling out of alignment, he will bring you back to himself. How does he do it? Through instructions. May your ears never become deaf to him. In the name of Jesus, I cancel you to buy of me gold. It's in Christ we have the best. Is in Christ. Tried in the fire. I know that when I was praying the night, the day he told me, the purest of oil, the finest of wheat, they are in his hand. What? He said, that you may be rich. Excuse me. But the guy said, I am rich. And God said, you don't know what is called rich. Riches. Until it is for me, you are not rich. Hello. And white raiment, righteousness again. So God is saying, you can be rich and be righteous. So who is telling us the lies? That when you follow Jesus, you'll be wretched. Who says that? Okay. Apostle is not looking like one. Prof is not looking like one. And all of you, I can't see any one of you looking wretched. Amen? Amen? Oh, you must say, Pastor, you don't understand. I don't have in my bank account up to 100,000. You know what? That's not what the Lord promises. What he promises is that he will supply all your needs. The day he told me, he said, I, I will supply all your needs. So 100,000 comes, needs comes, he makes the supply. After that one, you look at the, there's nothing there, but you're not bothered. 250,000 needs arrive. He fulfills it. You say, I don't know how God is doing it. And he's fulfilling his word. That thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see. I pray God we anoint you so that you can begin to see. You will see clearly. Amen. You will see where God is leading you. Amen. You will see errors that the devil is bringing your way. So that you will not fall into his trap. Amen. But look at what he said in verse 19. Oh, time up. Thank you very much. Verse 19. Please give me 19. Can we all read this? Please. Please read it again. If God loves you, what will he do for you? He will rebuke you. He will do what? Is it because he hates you? That's how God makes vessels unto honor. When he finds out you are stamping out of alignment, 
out of his love, he will rebuke you, he will chasten you. So he's now saying, since you know I guarantee this, what should you do? Be zealous. And where you need to repent, repent. Please rise to your feet. My time is up, so I won't lead a prayer. Let me leave that for the apostle. Apostle, please come.